So hello and welcome everyone once again for episode 6 of the Movies of 1999, a podcast where we watch one movie every week that's selected by Bingo Machine. My name is Jason Hutchins. And I'm Craig Talbot. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about The Straight Story, which was the movie we watched at the movie night last week. And I paired that up with an obscure little Australian movie called Strange Planet, starring Naomi Watts. And that was the link between Straight Story and Strange Planet, because Naomi Watts is a favourite of the director, David Lynch, who directed Straight Story. So how are you this week, Craig? I really enjoyed the, uh, the movie night last week. Uh, I've found a lot of comparisons between David Lynch's movie in this case, and I kept saying this on the movie night, I know, but there was this movement on SBS called Slow TV. I don't know if you ever got into any of uh, um, those. I'm, uh, I've seen videos on YouTube of, of eight-hour train journeys and things like that. Yes, so. yeah, exactly right. Um, <laughs> and the idea was they didn't actually do any cut takes or any cut. Well, they did do... They did do cuts, but they didn't do any takes. It's, a, it's so real, they just real feel, time. Real time. Is real time. time. Okay, yes. Yeah. Sorry, that's the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to say the straight story felt a little bit like that. I just wanted to get that out <laughs> early on in the, <laughs> early on in the podcast. Well, but we'll that's get right. into that when we start talking about the movie. But let's start with the straight story, and I'll read a brief synopsis. The Straight Story, directed by David Lynch, is a heartwarming and gentle departure from his usual surreal style. Based on a true story, it follows Alvin Strait, an elderly man played by Richard Farnsworth, who embarks on an extraordinary journey to reconcile with his estranged ailing brother, Lyle. Unable to drive due to his health and eyesight, Alvin decides to travel from Iowa to Wisconsin on a lawnmower, leading to a slow-paced odyssey across the American Midwest. Throughout his journey, Alvin encounters various people from different walks of life, sharing stories and imparting wisdom, reflecting the film's themes of family, ageing and the simplicity of life. The film is notable for its stunning cinematography that captures the picturesque rural landscape and for its poignant, understated storytelling. The Straight Story is a deeply moving tale of determination, kindness and the enduring power of family bonds, showcasing Lynch's versatility as a filmmaker. And thanks for ChatGPT4 once again for writing that for me. So, Craig, what did you think of The Straight Story? I actually did really enjoy it. Um, it's a very highly rated movie, I noticed, by Rotten Tomatoes. It's a 94% by the critics and 94% by the uh, user reviews. It is not a movie that I would have watched on my own. It's probably the first David Lynch production I've ever watched that I actually understood the story and understood <laughs> what was going on all the way through. I, I wonder if he called it the straight story because it's the first time he's done like a straight story. I think definitely for sure that that would have been part of the reason why they chose that title. But I think it begins really in a very Lynchian way. And I think it took you a while to get into the movie because of that, because the camera moves in very slowly. There's this lady uh, sunning herself, you know, between mm. two houses. It moves in very slowly, taking its time and sort of zooming in on a window. And then we hear a thump um, because Alvin Strait has fallen onto the, the ground inside his house. I think even then you were commenting about how slow everything was. Yes. So did it take um, you a while look, to get into the movie? Look, in the end, I enjoyed the movie. Um, Janet Maslin says, for example, that it's a slow movie, folksy. She calls it profoundly spiritual. And I, and I thought that was a good quote. That probably sums the movie up. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with David Lynch's style. And I think for uh, people who are fans of his work, they would immediately feel at home with the mm, way yeah, the movie is working. For those of us who uh, are not fans of David Lynch, it's, it is. It took a while to get into. But I think it suited the story and it suited the character of Alvin Strait. A great example of visual storytelling, I think. And, and I think the cinematography yeah. really brings you into the, the location. Like you really feel that you're there with him. Yeah. The, the fact that the scenes move so slowly sort of gives you time to enter his world, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. Apparently the film was actually filmed in sequence. 
I noticed that there's a few continuity errors where they've gone the wrong way across a bridge or mm. there's a scene outside the grotto where they actually went in the wrong direction and people picked up who live in those areas picked up on that. I, f- I found the most interesting thing was the, char- the, the actual actor himself. His life, real life experience mirrored that of Alvin Strait's. Mm. Mm. So Alvin Strait set off on this journey because he discovers that he's very ill. And, the, and, and he wants to re- reconcile with his brother who's had a stroke. That's right, yeah. But Richard Farnsworth himself, who had, had actually been a stuntman in his younger years and then had become an actor in his the later part of his life, he was terminally ill with bone cancer during the sh- shooting of the film, mm-hmm. which caused the paralysis of his legs. As you can see quite clearly in the film, he actually took the role out of admiration for Alvin Strait when he read the story or the script and his co-workers were absolutely amazed at the guy's tenacity because he was obviously in pain during mm. the, the movie. So unfortunately, very sadly, Farnsworth actually committed suicide later due to the pain of his... Yeah, condition. yeah, and, and that's, yeah. that's uh, you know, terrible that he was in so much pain that he took his own life. Yeah, we these days we'd probably call it that he euthanised himself rather than suicide. Yeah, and, and two, you know, it, that sort of opens up another can of worms, you know, with assist, yeah. assisted suicide yeah. and, you know, that's a bit of a moral discussion that people have these days. But the movie itself, I think, is about growing old with dignity. And I think David Lynch has a lot of respect for these elderly actors that he works with. You know, a lot of them are humorous and they have some humorous character flaws, especially at the beginning of the movie. He has four buddies that hang out in the hardware store, I think. I th- they are a little bit of comic relief, I think. They are a bit guys. of comic relief, but v- but I think David yeah. Lynch still has a lot of respect for, for them. He, he doesn't sort of yes. make fun of them. He sort of... And the same with um, who's uh, Alvin Straits's daughter. Her name's Rose. Sissy Spacek. Sissy Spacek. She's intellectually disabled, I think, or, or you know, I'm not sure yeah, what her... That, again, that's that's not made completely clear. No, uh, no. And... She, she, has a, she has a speech, certainly does have a speech issue, um, where she finds it very difficult or, to speak or clearly, maybe, and she speaks maybe very slowly. she has slowly. a stutter or something like that. But, it, but again, they don't make a big deal of it. No. And, and Lynch treats her with a lot of respect, even though sometimes she is mm. a bit of comic relief herself because when Alvin yeah. Strait makes the phone call to get his social se- security check, he sort of has a chuckle at, you know, because she's looking for it on the other end of the phone without letting go of the phone and stuff like that. Yeah, I thought the most powerful scene in the movie for me was the scene where they talk about their World War II experiences himself and a, another older gentleman who he has a beer with in the town that he's stuck in for a while. Definitely. Uh, I can't remember the name of the character, unfortunately, but I thought that was probably the most powerful scene in the movie yes. and probably one of the best depictions of the kind of trauma that these guys went through and mm. the way that they had to deal with it, mm. I've seen on film. Quite yeah, frankly, yeah. it was re- that was really really well done, and it didn't cut away to a flashback. It was just no. just the camera was just holding on him as he told this story, and it was a very honest depiction of how uh, obviously a lot of these uh, uh, men would have felt coming back from the war because they weren't given the help or psychological assistance that yeah. um, they probably really really needed. Yeah, and like you said, it was a road trip movie. It was all filmed chronologically, and mm. he has all these little encounters along the way. I wrote down it's like a series of vignettes or something like that. At the beginning of the movie, his ride on mower breaks down, and he encounters a bus filled with old women his age that are going on a, a tour. And yeah, yeah. And then when he gets going for real, he encounters a, a runaway girl and and has a moment with her. And then there's a bicycle race. And then there's the yes. lady that hits the deer. And then there's a section where he loses control going downhill. And and there there are all these little moments. And I think in each of those moments, he's atoning or, or he's sort of shedding some of his regrets that he's had during his life or he, he's imparting some of the wisdom that he's learned as he's grown older. And that, that, yeah, I, that changes him. And it's almost like he needs to go on this journey to, in order to be able to reconcile with his brother because he sort of comes to terms with who he is himself in a way. Yes, no, I, I think that's um, absolutely right. I think that was, that was part of the message of the movie. 
The only um, part of the movie that I felt didn't really fit very well was that whole weird sequence with the deer, oh. the woman hitting the deer. <laughs> I, I think I commented again on the movie night and I was like, yeah, there goes David Lynch reasserting his mad side. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know this, uh, there was a moment of Twin Peaks in that in that particular it was, scene. It was. And yeah. Because ultimately he slaughters the deer and cooks it and uses it for his yes. food. So it is providing for him in a way. But I, I think also watching this woman get so angry was maybe contrasting with his own tendency to do that. We never really saw that side of him. We only heard about that side no. of him. But yeah, I, I am there, wondering, it was very Lynchy in that moment. I am wondering what, what it is about Wisconsin, because this is another <laughs> movie in Wisconsin. I am a bit worried about the state of Wisconsin in 1999. Mm. There's uh, people who drink too much in Wisconsin um, and Iowa for that matter. I think this is the first time Iowa's been a bo- in a movie. So mm. I think we're, we're slowly moving, <laughs> we're moving away. It actually cost uh, only $10 million to film, mm. apparently, which doesn't seem like a lot of money. No, no. But maybe I'm thinking budget. about that in, in 2023 terms. It didn't feel like a low-budget movie. As you said, the, the cinematography was excellent. It only earned $6.42 million in the US, and mm. I'm, I'm not really quite 100% sure how IMDb does this, but it says the worldwide box office was 6.42. I don't know if that's an additive number or if it's just they're combined mm. together. But if it is indeed the combined amount, he'd only just made back his budget. Um, that is cycling race, by the way. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole on that one. Yeah, being a um, cycler. Because I was curious. From back in the day. Yeah, so. back in the day. That's right. Yep. Um, so apparently that's an event called the annual Great Bicycle Ride Across Iowa. And it's been happening since 1973. And so it's a real thing, and it did actually happen to Alvin. Interestingly, though, it's done in July, and that's not harvest time in the US, from what I understand. Right. They do make a big point about it being harvest time in the movie. Mm. Um, and I, I can understand why David Lynch filmed during harvest time, because that's probably the prettiest time mm-hmm. of the year to film mm. in Iowa. So there's a sequence in the movie where he loses control coming downhill. And, and that's something that really happened uh, when Elvin Strait was riding his lawnmower across the country for real. But as he comes down the hill, there's a house that's on fire. Mm. And that really happened as well. And what I really enjoyed about this movie is it's one of the only ones where I had to go out and purchase the DVD because I couldn't find it on any streaming services, not even for for rent. I didn't want to get the movie illegally if I could avoid it. So I managed Mm. to track down the DVD. There was actually a Blu-ray re-release in 2021 and that's the one that i got and that's okay. that's filled with special features and and commentary which the original dvd release didn't have one of the special features is an interview with a couple of the location scouts that worked on this movie you know they're two old guys now but they're telling all these great stories about the production of this movie yep and one of the stories is they actually rebuilt the house on the ruins of the original house that burnt down so it's in exactly the same place (laughs) (laughs) which i which i thought was quite interesting and what had happened in real life is it was a it was an old wooden house that had a termite infestation so the the local firefighter crew was using it for training i'm not sure whether that comes across in the movie but you know there doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency in in terms of putting the fire out but i think it's also a callback to what happened to to rose Alvin's daughter because yeah because there was a fire in her house and right. he tells a story that somebody you know she wasn't home at the time and she'd left somebody to watch the kids yeah. and then there was a fire and and one of her boys got got seriously burned but yes. there's a bit of a fan theory uh, if you can call it that that it was Alvin himself who had been left to watch the kids Oh, okay. And it was his uh, struggles with alcohol that were to blame for him not reacting to the fire and and getting the kids out of that situation. So so maybe that adds a bit more depth to this journey of atonement that I was talking about, because obviously he has a lot of regrets from when he was in the Second World War as a sniper and had yeah. there was a an incident of friendly fire. He'd actually killed one of the members of his own squad and had never revealed that to anybody else. And, and perhaps this is a similar situation where it's one of his big life regrets. But I thought that was interesting yes. that they, they had that a building on fire. I kind of felt that that was another one of those David Lynch weird things that he kind of loves. 
I can imagine David Lynch looking at that. I especially loved how there was the people on the, what do you call those? Like in the lawn, lawn chairs. Lawn chairs watching the, it. The, the lawn chairs all gathered <laughs> around watching it because that's like the best thing to happen that day in, uh, in that town. A bit of Which I can, I can, I can understand that. Um, again, I felt that that was a bit of a David Lynchian moment. I didn't mm. go as in deeply in it as you did. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that was a nice lead into the relationship that he develops with the people that he stays with while his uh, tractor is being repaired. Yeah. And I thought that sequence was really well done, That the storytelling in that particular part of the movie. That was probably the most interesting part of the movie mm. for mine. Every, yeah. Everybody really seems to care for him and, and look after him and, and not to discourage him from going on this journey. I mean, when he's... I think by the time he's staying with those people, he only has like 90 miles to go or something like that. Yeah, they said it was like a half day's journey and, to get to where he needed to go. Mm, and By car. Yeah. By car, and you know, he's he's quite adamant that he has to complete this on his lawnmower. Mm. Yeah, I do wonder about how different Australia and America are that someone could actually do this. I, you could tell there were some frustrated drivers, particularly in the early part mm. of the movie. But mm. his his second tractor seems to be a bit faster. So, and then when it's jazzed up a little bit by the uh, what are they? The Olsen twins, I think they were. Yeah, the Olsen twins. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Olsen. Why twins. the Olsen twins of all names? <laughs> yeah. I, I think, again, that's a little bit of a David Lynch here having a little bit of fun. Um, I suspect there was some truth in that. The actual twins who are the actors, they're actual brothers in real life. They're both actors. Yeah, the Farley brothers. And, 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 uh, and of yeah. course, Chris Farley, he died a few years before, I think. He was very famous for a while there as a comedic actor. Yeah, I th- they, they were done very well. But again, that was a little bit of a Lynchian moment, mm. I felt. You know, like you just can't resist these little silly moments. But in, in a court, it was quite a straight story. Mm. I couldn't find Roger Ebert's review, actually. He uh, did do one, but I, I couldn't yeah, he, find he it. Yeah, he apparently gave it a perfect score and n- oh, is that right? normally would not have given... Like, he did not like David Lynch movies at all. Um, right, he, right. He always well, said that he thought David Lynch was being wasted on these silly ideas that he came up with himself. I mean, this is a case of a director directing someone else's material, which yeah. David Lynch doesn't do very often. He only did The Elephant Man and June, I think, but he might have written the screenplays for those two movies. I'm not sure. Right. So um, Emmanuel Levy thought that this was uh, David Lynch's simplest, most straightforward and most mature film to date. And I, I think there's an argument to be made for that, mm, for David definitely. Lynch. You know, it's a he, he definitely controlled the way he told the story. I think so. And and as a David Lynch fan myself, I think if I had gone and seen this in the cinema back in 1999 when it came out, I would have been very disappointed because I would have gone in expecting to see a, a Lynchian style film. Yep. But I think watching it now 25 years later and mm. and being 25 years older, I got a lot more out of this movie and it would be up there with my other favourite uh, David Lynch movies for sure. Like time has been very kind to this movie, I think. I think in the scope of the movies that we've seen so far, this one rates pretty highly mm. as well. Mm. I, it was a really um, enjoyable watch even though as i said it was slow and all that kind of stuff but it it was a good story a well-written and an interesting story yeah even though it's slow it's not overly long and you sort of get into that slow i'm i mean the story is about a slow journey um Mm. the soundtrack which is david lynch's usual collaborator what's his name angelo badalamente he did the twin peaks i think he did scores for other movies as well he's quite well known mulholland drive Talking about Mulholland Drive, that came out a couple of years after this, I think. Mm. But that was actually supposed to be a TV show. And when it wasn't picked up, David Lynch re-edited, you know, what he'd shot for the pilot into a movie. Later on, that happened with the Inland Empire as well, where David Lynch had been filming a series of short films. And he's very prolific uh, in terms of making short films. And he edited a bunch of those into a movie that was released called Inland Empire. But in terms of a traditional movie that was filmed, you know, with a screenplay as if it was a standalone movie, this movie from 1999 is David Lynch's last movie made, you know, in that traditional format. Right, this is his last movie. You think of him as a movie director, but this was his last movie movie. Uh, 25 years ago. Right, wow. It's interesting, uh, Sissy Spacek is actually credited... She's at the top of the credits in this movie, which is interesting. Probably as the most well-known actor, I guess. The lady who actually appears first, I don't know her particularly well myself, Jane Galloway Heights, but apparently she's been in a number of things and she was a pretty well-known actress. Mm. 
It says she helped uh, launch the careers of Steve Carell, Stephen Colbert, a whole bunch of people, as because she uh, was a casting agent. Oh. So she was, uh, as well as an actress in her own right. So we have a casting um, agent who's become a, an actor. We've, we've got a stuntman who's become an actor. What do you know about the cinematographer? Yeah, yeah. Because he, he was apparently 80 years old while working on this movie. So, so right, I, is that right? I think he'd come from uh, westerns and things like that. And this movie really is filmed in the style of a western in some sense. The cinematography is done by a gentleman called Freddie Francis. He was born in 1917, so he would have been... 80 years uh, old. Pretty yeah. old at this yeah, pretty old at this time. He died in uh, 2007. He's well known for a, a lot of, well, he's worked on a lot of movies. He's won two Oscars mm. uh, in his time, um, nominated for a whole bunch. He, he, he actually was the cinematographer for the 1980 uh, version of The Elephant Man. Oh, okay. Uh, he was the cinematographer for Cape Fear, for Glory, which is a, a Civil War movie mm-hmm. it, it is interesting the little rabbit holes that you can go down i know the, i know I, different people every week yeah. I'm, I'm going down rabbit holes i really enjoyed watching the special features on the dvd and they opened up new rabbit holes for me to go down as well i told you there was a special feature where they were talking about it talking to two of the location scouts another story they told was about the deer that deer lady scene that you like so much craig <laughs> so david lynch was just like we we need a dead deer and these two guys were just given the task of you've got to go and find a dead deer this is while they're making the movie right so so right. rather than the the special effects department or whatever the prop department coming up with a, a stuffed deer or something these guys just phoned up the local police and said let us know when you get a report Port of a roadkill deer you know a week or so later they got a call from the police saying that there's a, a deer lying on the side of the road in this area the this neck of the woods and they, they had to go and find it and then figure out how to get it into their uh, truck and i think they then took it to a butcher and, and kept it on ice until they needed it in the film um, oh, so, so it's just right. just crazy the the links that they went to the things that they had to do while while shooting this movie. Yeah, some sometimes the the backstories into some of these little moments are quite fascinating, mm. aren't they? And, um, and yeah, they are the rabbit holes that we like so much. I think it, it's it's interesting. There's always these little uh, little stories. I was just going to say, out of the movies we've watched so far, this is the only one where I've watched it twice. Okay. Because the DVD came with a commentary track, I sat down yep. and watched it through a second time, and, and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the yeah, commentary track, and it's something I miss these days, because you don't get it with streaming services. But No, not a, not very often. Mm. I, I'll, have to, um, I'll have to borrow it off you if you yeah, don't mind yeah, and have sure. a listen to the commentary. The, uh, I'd like to see those, uh, those little stories that you mentioned. Mm, yeah, yeah, they're good. So, shall we move on to Strange Planet then? Yes, let's do that. So Strange Planet is an Australian romantic comedy film that explores the intertwining lives of a group of friends over the course of a year, set against the backdrop of Sydney's vibrant cityscape. The narrative delves into the complexities of relationships, love and friendship as it follows the characters through their personal and professional challenges. With a mix of humour and heart, the movie portrays the characters' journeys of self-discovery, their search for meaningful connections and the unpredictable nature of life and love, capturing the essence of late 20th century urban life life in Australia. Not a very good synopsis, chat GPT. You missed out all the details, I think. <laughs> but perhaps yeah. because this movie is so obscure, I, I should say really this movie takes place from New Year's Eve to New Year's Eve, right. so over the course of a year, That's which is one reason yeah. why it was a good choice, I think. There's three women and three men who are all That's living great. separate lives, but by the end of the movie, they come together. So what did you think, Craig, of Strange Planets? A, a difficult movie to get hold of, this one. Yeah, that was a that was a tricky one, and and thank you for helping me with, with that, Jason. Do you know what the the one thought I came away with after watching this movie was? It was actually really nice to hear Australian voices mm. and see Australian scenery. And after all of the movies that we've watched, you know, a few Jap- um, Japanese, like recently you and I have watched quite a few Japanese movies mm. outside of the podcast. I mean, and also within the podcast, we've obviously watched a lot of Hollywood movies. Mm-hmm. It was actually really nice to hear Australians on screen yes. and see Australians on screen. Um, I did walk away from that thinking that that was one of, one of the things that I really enjoyed. Yeah. The movie itself, however, probably not our finest work as a no. country, I would, uh, I would say. It's a bit of a mess. <laughs> but I, I do like the performances. They're, there's really... Yes. I'm not sure whether you'd call any of these people the lead actor, but I mean, there's three women. 
And that's yeah. Naomi Watts, who, of course, has gone on to have a very big career in Hollywood and has worked with David Lynch mm. a lot. Claudia Carvan, I think, who's mostly stayed in TV. Would that be right? Yeah, I think Claudia Carvan is, uh, is a pretty well-known name in Australia, if not overseas. I think she has done some stuff overseas. Tom Long, for me, every time I saw him, it, re- it reminded me of his character in a TV series called Sea Change. Right. And of course... Um, I don't know if you... I, I did watch Sea Change and Alice Garner, the yeah. last of the three female leads, was a yes. character in Sea Change as well. That's right. So I did feel Sea Change, particularly in that last part of the movie, mm. I did feel mm. shades of Sea Change. I, I did wonder if they were sort of banking on the success of Sea Change because that were, yeah. Tom Long... Yeah, it, it did feel a little bit like what, that. What years um, was, was Sea Change, do you remember? Um, so th- around this time, right. so 1998 to 2000, the original three series, mm. uh, I believe. So it was right in the middle of that period. And Sea Change was a very popular TV series in Australia at the time. Yeah. And Tom Long's character in this movie, though different, it, 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 he's another one of these guys I, who you kind of feel like he's always Tom Long, mm. no matter what movie he's in. And Alice Garner, again, she plays a similar kind of role. Yeah, I, in both I of really those like her things. performance. She's got this really natural mm. way of performing, and, and you really feel like that's her up on screen. Yeah. More so, I think more so than them, the other two yeah. female leads, I think. And, and I think maybe Naomi Watts is the weakest of the three in this movie. Yeah, honestly, I, I also thought that as well. Her character did her no favours no, at all. No. She played this really straight, apparently barista character yeah. who hadn't <laughs> finished her own architecture degree and it was like it didn't really fit her at yeah, all she didn't yeah. uh, it didn't fit uh, I don't think she really felt the character herself mm. even I think it was a hard character for her I think Claudia Carvan's part in this movie is another one of those ones where we look back on it with 2023 20, eyes mm. and sort of think yeah, that doesn't age well, right. you know. A, she, date, a, she, again, she dates married men. And... She dates married men in order to get ahead yep, kind yep. of thing. There is that, that very strong implication. And, uh, yeah, that doesn't date well in the no, modern world. No, she um, wasn't dating but, well yeah, I guess it's interesting. This movie cost uh, $4 million to make, apparently. Mm-hmm. Bug it if I know what they spent the $4 million bucks on, but <laughs> yeah, there you go. You, you, you um, it to, seems like a lot of money. You have to pay Hugo Weaving. Yeah. You know, th- yeah. Hugo Weaving, I think, is a standout in well, this movie. Well, he, he was in a major movie from this year, which I, we won't go into because we haven't watched it yet. But think about it. Right. He was in that Hollywood movie, and he was also in this movie. In, and in and I think his, I think his uh, performance in this movie is a bit of a standout. <laughs> Apparently, the uh, director... Emma Kate Krogan, she absolutely hated the character that he plays oh, in really? this movie. Really? But she really loved his performance. And I think he brings another level of performance to this movie I, that the others kind of lack. Towards the end of the movie, they have a like a Halloween costume party. Yes, And yes. Hugo Weaving turns up as a, a vampire. And I think he gets dumped, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right. Yeah. I tell you what, disappointed or, or sad vampire Hugo Weaving is like the funniest <laughs> thing <laughs> Especially when he puts his teeth back in it. Yeah, yeah, you know, so yeah. He goes and puts teeth his back teeth in. back in. And, and, and he's like, dejected and, and you know, his shoulders yeah, well, are slumping and he puts his teeth back in. It's so funny. Stops off with his teeth in <laughs> <laughs> into the night. <laughs> yes, I thought that was quite funny. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's part of the genius of Hugo Weaving because, mm, you yeah. know, he's that kind of, he is definitely that kind of actor. Sorry, Emma Kate Krogan. So she co-wrote this movie with another gentleman called Stavros Kazanstidis. They produced both of these movies together, her and Stavros. They were going to make another movie called Revolver at the same time as Strange Planet mm. and then release them separately. The movie Revolver, though, never got actually made mm. or finished, so that was never released. Even though it cost $4 million to make, it only earned half a million dollars. Yeah, it was a bit office. of a flop, wasn't it? Because I don't think it got much of a release in the US. Not really a movie that could be released outside of Australia, I think. It is very Australian. And, and when you look at uh, Emma Kate Krugan, I really get the impression that she's just writing about her own experiences, like writing yes, about her true. own yeah. life. Her previous movie was called Love and Other Catastrophes from 1996, which, interestingly enough, it starred Frances O'Connor from uh, Mansfield Park last week and that was probably her first okay. movie role uh, before she yeah. moved overseas and pursued Hollywood movies and, and whatever. 
Love and Other Catastrophes was a huge success in Australia, but also a success overseas because they took that uh, movie to the Cannes Film Festival and Toronto and Sundance and all of the film festivals, and they got a big reception. And uh, Fox wrote them a check for $800,000 to sort of get the movie released in other territories. But I think Love and Other Catastrophes had been filmed on a budget of about $39,000. That was their entire right, budget. So wow. comparing it to, a, did you say the budget was $4 million for this, yeah, which was right. her second movie? So, yeah, I thought that was interesting. And yeah. I actually re-watched Love and Other Catastrophes during the mm-hmm. week because I'd forgot, forgotten about it. But at the time, I, I remember loving that movie. It was set during the course of a single day at Melbourne University, and they were all undergraduate students. I, I think Alice Garner was in it. She was doing her PhD, but she spent the whole movie avoiding her supervisor, who's trying to get her to finish her thesis. And that's exactly what I was doing back at the time that the movie came out. <laughs> and it, it was really nostalgic to watch it. And it really felt yep. true to life. And I, I think that's what Emma Kate did. She wrote about her own experiences. And this movie, Strange Planet, was very nostalgic as well. If you look back on Sydney in the year 1999. It, yes. You know, the music, the, the locations, it was... Yeah, really good soundtrack to this movie. Good music. Yeah, as you mentioned, it takes place over a 12-month period in Sydney. It's a very Sydney movie, if I very can be Sydney so bold movie, yeah. to say that. It's a, it, I, I actually I did actually enjoy the movie in the end. I didn't like it at the beginning, yeah, yeah. and I really struggled to watch the first part of the movie. Yeah, uh, the beginning in Sydney. It bit. was a bit... Yeah. The only bit that was really, uh, I found quite funny, was the Neil character. And his obsession with handbags and the likening them to vaginas, which I found very strange and very... He's got this theory about well, that ladies' handbags. He has that and theory and every, everything he knows about women is from reading Cosmo magazine. And, Cosmo, apparently, um, that's right. Yeah. but He's actually the son of David Williamson, who's yeah, a very famous a playwright. Uh, yeah. playwright. Mm. That's exactly right. And he, he, I thought his performance was actually pretty good. He, he was a lot of fun uh, and his character was interesting and the fact that he's sort of into... I'm not sure whether he was doing online dating, but he was definitely using a dating agency to... Yeah, I don't think there was online dating at the time, but there was there were dating agencies, as you mentioned. But it, it, um, it was funny that his, his mate sort of looked down on that, you know, the whole idea of using a dating agency, whereas these days... It, it's, it's natural, yeah. like it's yeah. As someone who, uh, well, I, I guess we both were, you know, dating and mm. getting married mm. and all of these sorts of things in that time period. It's it, it wasn't. It was actually probably harder than it is now. Oh, yeah. When I look back, because we didn't have the connections that you have now, no, social media connections. I mean, I often uh, mention to people I lost contact with so many friends in the nineties because it was really really hard to keep track of them because unless you had their phone number, you know, not everyone had this permanent mobile number that we have no, now. No, no, it's permanent. And email addresses email and addresses. social media yeah. presence. Yeah, it was really difficult uh, uh, to keep track of people mm. in the 90s. So, you know, if people moved house and stuff like that, you lost track of them completely. So the performances of the three male characters was pretty good as mm. well, I thought. Yeah. They're kind of unheralded in this movie because it focuses on the women a bit. But I actually thought Tom Long's performance was actually really, really good. Mm. I liked the performance of Neil. I thought Hugo Weaving actually brought some uh, acting chops Gravitas. to the actual movie. Yeah. Gravitas, yeah, that's the word. Yep. Um, Carvan, uh, Claudia Carvan, she was pretty good. She's pretty good. And, and, and I suppose the reason why I didn't like her character is because her character wasn't particularly likable mm. in, in a lot of senses. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them aren't particularly likable. Yeah, and I, and I think that kind of hurt the movie because... I think so. If you're watching a movie about six people you don't really like very much, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a slog. Mm. It becomes mm. a bit of a slog. The only character I really liked in the end were those two male characters, mm. the, Neil and and Tom Long's character. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. For me, it's more about the the music and the locations. Um, so, yeah, that's true. So when you do get a bit out of touch with the characters, I think what saved the movie for me was the soundtrack and looking back at on the Sydney of 25 years ago. So it was nostalgic. Yeah, I, nostalgic, but I was in, ultimately forgettable, yeah. you know. Yeah, and, and I think that, that Sydney... Sydney now is often painted as a city where everyone's very stressed and very worried about their future and all that kind of thing. And I think Sydney of of that time, mm-hmm. 25 years ago, was probably more relaxed. Mm. Uh, things hadn't quite got quite as serious, though it was still a very fast paced and, and whatever city. But yeah, I thought um, I thought as you said, Alice Garner. Yeah, Alice Garner really her character brought some life and interest. Yeah, of the to the scenes that she was in. So when you look at the six people, the three women and three men, they all have 
pretty major character flaws, apart really from the Ellis Garner character, Sally. Mm. She just wants to have a good time. She's just out to party and yep. have fun. Yeah. So, yeah, though that leads her that leads her down a path that she later regrets. Right, yes. But yeah. I'm gonna to have to agree with you. I didn't think Naomi Watts was a particularly yeah, yeah. interesting character in this movie. I didn't really like her too much. The other fellow, the you know, the sort of the hunk character. I, I don't know the guy's name off the top um, of my head. He's, jo- um, he's Joel, I think. He's the Joel. Yeah, he's the guy Joel. who I mean, his wife leaves him, and he sort of goes into yeah, a and hunk. he spends a lot of the movie. Mm. He, he spends a lot of the movie in tears and crying mm. and all of that kind of stuff, which I guess was tries to commit um, suicide pretty... by uh, downing a bottle of multivitamins. <laughs> a bottle of multivitamins. <laughs> that's right. It's uh, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting movie. Probably deserved a little bit more attention, but I think this is one of those movies of 1999 that just got lost in mm. everything mm. else. In the noise. There was so much else going on. It probably was better than its half a million dollar box office. So I think Emma Kate Krogan was sort of on the path to success after Love and Other Catastrophes and that movie yes. blowing up at all the film festivals. And then this was her second movie, which you'd expect to boost her career even more, but it was That's a bit right. of a letdown. But what was interesting is she did move to L.A. and she was in line to direct a Hollywood movie, which was to be A Scanner Darkly, which is a Philip K. Dick story with a screenplay okay. written by Charlie Kaufman. Now, Charlie Kaufman, of course, is famous for writing one of the movies that we'll be watching this year and then also adaptation in the following years. So I was very curious about that because I only learned about that by researching this movie. And so I got my hands on the screenplay. So I've been reading that. That's my rabbit hole that I've gone down uh, today. Oh, God, another one. Yeah. Yeah. So I started reading Charlie Kaufman's screenplay for Philip K. Dick's A Scanner Darkly, which was to be directed by Emma Kate Krogan, of all people. And and that project just right. never got off the ground. But imagine that, going yeah, from these doesn't... Australiana movies to dark science fiction. Yeah, she hasn't really done a lot since Strange Planet. She hasn't done uh, anything she, since a Strange Planet. She hasn't, she hasn't directed. And there is a very interesting New York Times profile piece on her from 1999, which kind of maybe gives a bit of insight into why she and the Hollywood system didn't gel as well as they might have right. for other directors coming from Australia. She was on the dole in Australia and she she had to go into Centrelink or whatever it was at the time and explain that she wouldn't be in for the next month or two because she was going to be traveling around the world going to all these film festivals. And like this person that she was talking to at Centrelink just couldn't comprehend that this person who was on the dole was a famous movie director who was going to the Cannes Film Festival. Two days after leaving Centrelink, she was on a private yacht shaking hands with Robert De Niro or something like that. Yeah, just the, just this this whirlwind of a life. And you can imagine that for some directors that would lead to greater and greater things. And maybe yes. if you're a little bit more cynical about that whole system, then maybe that's where things peter out. Now, well, apparently she still lives in New York. Yeah. So according to her Facebook, <laughs> yeah. just stalking her on Facebook just now, <laughs> she's uh, living in New York. So she must be doing something, I guess, but it yeah. doesn't seem to be related to film. She does express uh, an interest only... in, in directing again. Yeah, I'm not sure what opportunity she has. Yeah, she apparently has been working on a number of movies, but none of them have come to anything. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's what happens. Yeah, in, it's what can happen. But... But I, look, I, it's not a movie that I regret watching, but no. I, again, I don't think it's going to score highly in my list of movies for the year, yeah. which is ever-growing. <laughs> no, it, Growing rapidly at this point. It was entertaining and forgettable, and I think we might have enjoyed it more than someone who's not Australian and someone who hadn't grown up during that time yeah. period. I think for us, we were roughly the same sort of age as the characters in the movie yeah, at the time yeah, exactly. of this movie, like not, not too far distant, so um, it's probably nostalgia for us, I guess. I I spent a little time in Sydney around that time. So, yeah, it it did look familiar to me. Well, I lived there for three years, a little bit after the the time period of this movie. So it was nostalgic. So there you go. We've spoken about uh, The Straight Story and Strange Planet, two movies that were linked via Naomi Watts. And Mm. let's cut now live to this week's uh, movie night to find out which two movies we'll be talking about this time next week. So over to you, future Jason. Okay, here we are at the movie night, and and we're looking for a short movie this week, one with a low runtime. So what can you conjure up? 
What number is it? It's number two. Number two. Far out. We've got a single digit for the first time. And number two is office space. So there you go. <laughs> From Mike Judge, creator of Beavis and Butthead and co-creator of King of the Hill, comes a movie about people who go to work. <laughs> who are part of a team. And remember, next Friday is Hawaiian Shirt Day. Okay, if I could set the building on fire. Who respect their boss. We need to talk about your flair. Well, I have 15. 15 pieces on. 15 is the minimum. Brian, for example, has 37 pieces of flair on today. <laughs> and a terrific smile. And need to escape. I don't like my job, and I don't think I'm gonna go anymore. One of these days, I, I, I just I just kick this piece of... I'm thinking now it might be more fun to just get fired. And I've always wondered what that would take. Oh, Peter, listen. Uh, well, it looks like you've been missing quite a bit of work lately. Well, I wouldn't say I've been missing it, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a straight shooter with upper management written all over him. We're going to be getting rid of these people here. Mr. Samir. Okay, thank you. Not going to work here anymore anyway. <laughs> you haven't been showing up and you get to keep your job. Actually, I'm being promoted. Thank you, Bob. This is a... It sucks! They're gonna throw you out on the street so that Bill Lumberg's stock will go up. Ooh, it's completely unfair. Inatech deserves to go down. We're just the guys to do it. Tell me about that virus you're always talking about. The one that could rip off the company for a bunch of money. I'm not going to do anything illegal, Peter. Illegal? Samir, this is America. The worst they're gonna do is they put you in a white collar minimum security resort for a couple of months. You know they have conjugal visits there? I might be showing them my O face. Oh, oh. They let you have sex with women? They sure do. Okay, I'll do it. Office space. I know you've been getting pretty depressed about your job and everything, and so I just wanted to tell you good things can happen in this world. I mean, look at me. <laughs> And Office Space has been paired up with a movie called Holy Smoke, which is a fairly obscure one. At an age when she could do anything, Ruth wanted to experience everything. She was looking for herself. What she found was a whole new way of life. Fearing the worst, her family found the one man who could break the spell. It's such a relief that you've arrived because we've all been so worried. Look at this, it's a gift. See, she's coming towards me. This could be over in 12 hours. I imagine you could persuade any woman to do anything. Do you have a website? This is a complete waste of time. You're never gonna break me. There's no way I can even listen to someone like you who dyes their hair. But you date little Barbie dolls. You're so brainy. You're so big. Now they're about to experience an awakening. You want to sleep with me, don't you? I'm a regular person, and you know it. Both spiritual. What about you kiss me? No, Ruth, I can't do that. And sexual. Take my pants off. I think we'd better phone your mother. I don't think Mom's paying him to... You're out of control. You didn't seem to mind last night. From Academy Award winner Jane Campion, director of The Piano. Well, I still love life, and I'm here! Miramax Films presents Academy Award nominees Kate Winslet and Harvey Keitel in an all-out battle of the sexes. Holy smoke. And thanks for that. So there's the two movies that we'll be watching next week. Hopefully they'll be enjoyable ones. We'll see how they go. So any final words from you, Craig? Uh, as always, looking forward to the next two movies in the series, I guess. Yeah, so uh, let's draw a line under that one. We'll leave the final word to Margaret and David, as always. And from us, it's goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Who would ever have imagined that David Lynch would make a G-rated film released by the Disney Company? Well, he has. The Straight Story. Where is the creepiness, the menace of Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks and Lost Highway? In what must be the slowest road movie ever made, Lynchian elements do appear. The characters we meet in these small towns and villages and on the road all exhibit a dark side. Not everything is apple pie. Margaret.
It is a gem, isn't it? And it looks so splendid. I mean, this is one of those films, don't wait for the video, you've got to see it on the big screen. I do see him as almost a Christ figure. It's a beautiful I film. think there's more going on beneath the surface of this film than, yes. than you, you think. Well, it. maybe. <laughs> You'd think so with Lynch. It's four and a half stars for me. And for me too, four and a half.